Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Amen. Thank the choir for that. It made me miss everybody even more. The scene faces up there and... Uh, Hopefully we'll see those faces back out of here soon. Um, read to us as we continue in the book of Acts this day from the 18th chapter. We're going to skip a few verses here and there, the first to the fourth, and then 18, and then over, o over past that. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, he was the emperor, had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. And every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Then in the 18th verse, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, uh, then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Cenchrea because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left, left, left Priscilla and Aquila. And he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. I appreciated your, your uh, children's lesson, Sarah, uh, because it, it gets us at something that I think is significant, which is that most of us, I think, have gotten it all wrong. In thinking back over that first Christian church, it is tempting to focus in on the rather charismatically dynamic individuals who led the church to Peter, the other disciples, whose experiences with the risen Lord uh, set, a, set a whole new direction in their lives. To St. Paul, whose dramatic conversion uh, produced a leader who, in the estimate of most people, became almost second founder of Christianity after Jesus himself. For these were tremendous individuals, weren't they? People of power and vision who set out to, will, to, set out to, to actually win the world for Christ, who left an inheritance of faith that has reached down through 20 centuries to your life and to mine this morning. And yet, despite all that Peter and Paul and those other Christian leaders did, I rather fancy that the real impact of the Christian church came then as it does now, not from the dynamic leaders, which it may have had, but from the bulk of the followers of that faith, the lay folks who were just ordinary people, fa faithful if not fancy, respectable if not always actually respected. Because that's who God has always used to build his church in this world. In this regard, we might certainly think of that husband and wife team that is described for us here in Acts 18, Aquila and Priscilla. The scriptures tell us that these two, far from being charismatic preachers or even dull preachers for that matter, were ordinary lay people, made their living not by preaching or by being church professionals, but by cutting and fitting together the cloth and leather with the poles and the rods which comprise the ubiquitous skene or tent in the biblical world. They were not up front in the prayer meetings, 
nor were they like Luke and, and, and James, even, even the, the uh, chroniclers or the historians of the movement. They're simply two of those average Christians of their day, ordinary people like, like, like you and me, who might never have even made it into the scriptures at all, were it not for the simple fact that they heard a calling from God. And they did three things in response, which transformed them from the mundane and lifted them into the magnificent. See, first of all, we ought to say that if they were anything at all, Priscilla and Aquila were generous folks, particularly so in their hospitality to other people. One of the few things that we know about this couple is that wherever they went, it seemed that they had a kind of open door policy when it came to housing guests. All kinds of folks, preachers and creatures alike, seemed at one time or other to wander through those doors. When they were exiled from Rome to Corinth, for instance, they were exiled because the emperor Claudius got tired of all of the conflict between the traditional Jews and those who, Jews who had become Christians. One historian said they were always rioting. They, they invited a young fellow tent maker by the name of Paul to stay with them, even to work alongside of them as he got his feet wet in preaching the gospel to the Corinthians. And then later on, after they'd moved to Ephesus, they took in another young preacher, a gifted orator from Alexandria and North Africa by the name of Apollos. I want to tell you guys, anyone who will invite a preacher home to stay with them, much less two of them, is pretty special. But then it wasn't just the preachers whom this couple opened up their homes to. It was the whole Christian church as well, which in the first century, of course, had no buildings of its own, had to meet either in some rented halls or more likely in people's homes. Read a little bit between the lines here and you will figure out that in Corinth and in Ephesus, maybe later on in Rome itself after they had been able to return there, that Priscilla and Aquila were some of those who opened up their home to the rest of the believers, wherever they might have been. They had the spiritual gift of hospitality. They exercised it well. Even when it was, as it some, always will be sooner or later, inconvenient for them to exercise that gift. Secondly, these two folks were what we might call encouragers as well. People like Barnabas who saw it as their special duty to encourage other people in their faith and particularly to encourage preachers in their ministry. I love those people. We've been blessed to have some of those saints in every church we've served. When Apollos came to Ephesus, Dr. Luke tells us he was a learned man, a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great fervor. <laughs> he didn't even use notes, stood out in the front and just, just did it. <laughs> he, taught, he taught about Jesus accurately. But like a lot of Christians even today, Apollos didn't know a thing, so it appears, about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He only knew the baptism of John, not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now that's important, I think. Imagine, for instance, if, if a Methodist preacher showed up at a new appointment and had never heard of John Wesley. <laughs> Some church members would immediately be tempted to embarrass that preacher in front of others, to correct him or her in public, maybe to call up the DS and the bishop and say, we need somebody new here. I get that. But truth be told, it's difficult sometimes for those of us who are preachers to know what we should and shouldn't do, should and shouldn't say. We can easily disappoint people in our congregations, even if it's unintentional. I remember getting a card several years ago that said on the cover of it, very sweetly, you're the answer to my prayers. I thought, well, that's just so nice. Then I opened it up, and the inside said, you're not exactly what I was praying for, but apparently you are the answer. <laughs> Ouch. But in contrast, consider how Priscilla and Aquila handled their preacher 
that wasn't fully up to snuff. They took them into their home, and there in love and charity, not in front of other people, they privately explained to him the way of God more adequately, more accurately. They told him about the Holy Spirit. They didn't correct him in public or, 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 or somehow try to show him up. They didn't talk about him behind his back. They simply helped him grow in his understanding of the Christian faith. And let me tell you, my friends, if you ever happen to have a preacher who you think needs changing, maybe even setting straight, that's the way to help him. That's the way to help her. More than just that, that's the way. We ought to be encouraging everyone around us every day. Not critiquing, not criticizing each other's performances when it comes to living out this life of faith. Cheering them on instead, despite their deficiencies. John Maxwell once put it this way. He said that every one of us in life is either a lifter or a limiter of people. If you limit people, you limit not only them, but also yourself. But if you lift them up, there's no telling how far they or you can go. I think Maxwell was right about that. Every day, every, each one of us in, encounter people with an unseen sign hanging around their necks. Now, you won't find the words written there on a sandwich board or on a cutout or even on a t-shirt, but they're there all the same. Uh, no, matter, no less than if they were standing out on the highway with their thumb out and a piece of cardboard with some destination scroll on it. And those words are, can I get a lift? Can I get a lift from you in life? On a free ride. Just a lift, a word of encouragement, a sign of your interest, a sign that you believe in me, an endorsement. I think it is the task of the Christian church to be about giving those lifts to other people, raising their own sense of self-worth, showing them that we believe they're worthy of respect encouraging them in the exercise of their God-given gifts, natural abilities, helping them understand that they are important in the kingdom and they're important to other people, so they're important even to us. Increasingly, increasingly we are living in a critical age, not just an important age, but an age of criticism. A cancel culture, as some have called it, in which if you've ever even made one mistake, you can, make, you can be tortured on Twitter forever, unfriended on Facebook, have whatever statues there may be of you, real or just metaphoric, in your own mind or in the minds of other people, pulled down by the mob. Let's be really clear about this. Being a, being a believer in Christ not only does not protect you against adverse reactions to you, it can be an aggravator of those actions. Again, why do you think Aquila and Priscilla had to leave Rome in the first place? Because they were Jews who believed in Jesus. But Priscilla and Aquila were encouragers. It's part of what made this couple so extraordinary despite their ordinariness. But third, I think we must say this as well. Priscilla and Aquila dared to live out their convictions and take it all seriously. When ordinary folks and ordinary church members and ordinary lay people and even some ordinary preachers start doing that, all sorts of extraordinary things begin to happen. Aquila and Priscilla were willing, for instance, to pick up and follow Paul to Ephesus from Corinth, across the Aegean, and to live there, 
simply because they thought that they might be useful in that place. Again, not as preachers, not, not as pastors, uh, not as paid staff, but as lay folks for whom the faith was real and even a bit contagious. They dared to be true to their faith. And in turn, both Ephesus and Corinth the churches which met in their homes, we know, grew and prospered. The witness of Christ became stronger in those two communities than in almost any other city of the ancient Roman world because a kindly couple put their religion before their relationships, their, their Christianity above their convenience. And yes, even their faith before their finances. The church is built, so Jesus told us, upon the living stones, living stones of consecrated lives of otherwise ordinary people who simply decided that if Jesus is the Christ, then it's worth giving their lives and all they have to him. Oh, I get it. These are weird times. Nothing feels exactly right. Does it? Yesterday at the Woodlands, I, I helped in the ordination of some of our new class of deacons and elders. Usually that's a, that's a high point of the annual conference. And in this instance, uh, we were pre-recording. DeAndre's already worked on the music for it. Uh, we were, we were uh, and each person came up individually with just their spouse uh, and uh, they sanitized the uh, kneeler between every person. They stopped and the elders who came to help, uh, normally we would, we would lay hands on those people. Well, we didn't lay hands on them. We stood behind them and we held out our hands, jazz hands, uh, and we sort of empowered them through the air rather than touch them. Weird times. In a week or so, our kids go back to school. Only, only, not all of them. Just here in the Fort Bend ISD, there are more than 10,000, 10,000 kids who are not going to be able to do virtual learning online for various reasons. They're going to need to be at a, at a learning center on one of the school campuses we don't have enough but even if we can get that figured out the school's going to need volunteers we can simply spend four hours a day uh, um, however many days they can two days, three days, five days a week for, for maybe four weeks morning shift, afternoon shift you don't have to teach, you don't have to discipline, you don't have to fix them lunch, you don't have to fix their computers or their laptops if they go wonky on them, there's somebody there to handle that. You just need to come be a supportive adult, an encourager, or some kids who can become easily discouraged, a lifter in life, or some students who are already starting out behind. We need at least 20, at least 20 people from Christ Church to volunteer for this. We need you to do it by tomorrow. We'll work around your schedule. There's minimum training. It's a one hour online. <laughs> Everyone's going to have on masks. All the safety protocols will be followed. There's very little danger contracting anything but if we don't help there's a hundred percent chance that some of our kids are going to fall even further behind if you want to find out more you can give us a call or email us or, or come tonight we hope to have some school district folks at our, at our drive through service tonight I think we have uh, 20 or 30 cars already signed up for it. We hope, hope others of you will come too. You can go online and can do that today. Some of you might remember when many years ago, a tanker struck the Tampa Bay Sunshine Skyway Bridge early one morning in a dense fog. It caused that much traveled roadway to collapse into the waters 150 feet below. 
but because of the fog, no one could see what had happened. And so one after the other, six cars, a pickup truck, a Greyhound bus, simply drove right off the edge, plunging into the bay, uh, killing 35 people. Until finally, one rather ordinary man, an advertising representative named Don Albritton, uh, pulled off his shirt, started to frantically fly down the traffic. With that simple action, he saved countless lives. One guy, a teacher named Terry Butterfield, didn't realize why Al Britton was waving his shirt. He stopped anyway because he just happened to hear a sermon the Sunday before on being his brother's keeper. He pulled over to see what he could do for Al Britton, thought there was something wrong with him. <laughs> he saved his own life in the process. My friends, there are bridges out all over the world. There are bridges out in our own community. But we can do something about it. In the midst of all that's wrong today, maybe it's time to, to wave our shirts, let other people know about a better way. Uh, maybe it's time we explain the way of God more adequately, more accurately to others. For the real superstars of the Christian faith never have been preachers. Simply the unexceptional, ordinary people who have stepped forward to put their faith in, the, in, in, in practice, make the ministry of the church happen here and all around the world. Now, I get this. Some of you may still need to come privately to me to explain the way of God more adequately. And let me invite you to do so if you, if you have something. But like it was for Priscilla and Aquila, calling today is simply to open up your heart to other people, to practice biblical hospitality, to be an encourager, not a negative critic, to be a lifter of people, not a limiter of them. Calling is to come and follow him and love all of his people. Amen. Lord, your summons echoes true in you, but call my name. Let me turn and follow you. In your company I'll go, where your love and footsteps show, thus I'll move and live and grow.